tonight we have a collection of three true scary stories from the darkest pits of the internet. Before we begin, I would just like to thank those of you who have reinvested in me and my Patreon. Also, for those of you who have been subscribing, I really do appreciate it. But we still have 56% of yours unsubscribed, so let's see if we can change that. Anyway, without further ado, let's begin. Number 1 Here's my story. 16. Black and have a family down in Alabama. They farm and own a huge amount of land down in Huntsville. My uncle owns a big house and a bunch of trailers they put out in the woods for hunting or camping. Down south, cousins suggest that we go out there to camp. No, I'm a city kid from Chicago, so they tease the fuck out of me. Collect food kill a pig and some chickens and bring necessities to camp out for a few days. We get to the camp and it's obvious something is weird. Air has the weird electric smell like right before the storm, like ozone. We think nothing of it and unpack and go down to a little creek to swim for a few hours. All of a sudden, some older white guy and a white teenager come out of the bushes. He has a shotgun in the crook of his arm and says hello and asks us what we are doing this far back in the woods. Tell him about my uncle, who he knows, and says we are camping out. He tells us we need to be real careful out here and stick together, there was a big animal in the woods. His son, who is my age, asks if he can stay and hang out with us. He says okay. I'm going to stop green texting because the story is fairly long and the format is harder to write in. So we end up playing football dicking around with me, there's this white kid Tanner, five of my cousins and then four of their friends. In total, there were five girls and six boys. We all were around 15 to 17. We ended up just dicking the day away, so we head back to the camp and pulling out some stuff for a campfire, even though the trailers both had kitchenettes. Tanner says that his family's property sits up against my uncle's. He wants to run home and ask his dad if he can come out camping with us. My cousin Rooster says he's going to go with him since it's going to get dark soon. One of the girls also wanted to tag along. It's about 7 o'clock and it's starting to get pretty dark. They take flashlights and take the trail towards Tan's property. The rest of us chill, we make s'mores, drink and kiss on the other girls. About 30 or 40 minutes later, there's a smell of ozone again. You could smell it over the smell of the fire we had started. This really nasty, coppery smell, like right after you've had a nosebleed and it stopped. It wasn't exactly like dried blood, but was the nasty, metallic, back of your throat smell. We immediately think that it's some kind of electrical malfunction, or someone left a hot plate on or some shit. We search the trailers and nothing is on and we can smell it. All of a sudden, we can hear people booking down the path towards us, and Rooster, Tan and the girl all come running into the clearing, out of breath. And they don't even break stride, they all run into the trailer right by where the fire is. We all get the fuck out of there and into the trailers. They end up calming down, even Rooster is crying his fucking eyes out at this point. All the while, the fire is guttering lower and lower, so my other cousins say fuck it and are about to go outside to get the generator out of the shed between the trailers. Tanner goes fuck no, lock the front door, ain't nobody else going outside. He's been crying too and his eyes are bloodshot and puffy and his pants are dirty as shit. He goes on to tell us that they went up to the house, his father said sure he could go out camping, but to make sure they were careful on the way back and that maybe they should take one of the hunting rifles just in case. Evidently, Tanner had seen something in their yard a few days before. One of their pigs had come up, ripped and half-eaten. They assumed it was just some big cat or coyote, even though they didn't usually fuck with live animals. He had gone upstairs and packed his stuff and told his dad he would be okay without the rifle because coyotes avoid people, so they started walking back towards where they were camping. So Rooster finally stops crying and shaking. The girl already had, but she was just staring out of the window with a dumb look on her face. He says they had gotten halfway into the woods, towards the camp, when they started to hear shit in the forest. 
It was almost pitch black by this time, so they weren't sure at first what the fuck it was. The girl says that she heard something in the bushes right off the trail, and they all beamed their flashlights over there, and there was someone standing back in the woods in a little hollow. Rooster said they shouted at him, and told him that he was scaring the fuck out of them, and what a dick he was. He says that when he realised that the guy was facing away from them, he says that when he realised that the guy was facing away from them, so they keep walking, and they start smelling the nasty coppery ozone smell. They say that they look off into the forest on the opposite side, and it's a dude standing there, backwards slightly closer to the path. So now they start power walking, and Tan keeps going. I should have taken a fucking rifle. As they're telling the story, the smell is still super strong even inside the cabin. They say that after they started walking faster, a kind of low gibbering had started coming from both sides of the woods. And as they started booking it back to the trailer, the girl said she had flashed her flashlight out into the woods to the side of them and had seen something jerking itself through the woods. The gibbering just got louder and louder and when they could see the light from their campfire, something had come out of the woods about 40 yards behind them onto the track and they had just flat out ran as hard as they could to the trailer. So we're out in the fucking woods and we're assuming at this point it's some rednecks or some shit trying to fuck with us. All of a sudden, my other cousin, Junior, starts going on about how he went to school with a native kid who was telling him about the goat man or some shit. We promptly tell him to shut the fuck up because we don't need any spooky talk right now. But he just kept going on and on about how it's this fucking goat man and how we are in his woods and yada yada yada. Now at the time, I had never heard of the goat man or anything like that. But then a couple years ago, the year before I graduated from college, I had a man on for a roommate and I ended up asking him about it. And to sum it up, it's basically a fucking man with a head of a goat and he can shapeshift and he gets among groups of people to terrorise them. It's also supposed to be a kind of like Wendigo and it's a bad mojo to even talk about it and even worse if you see it. Keep in mind, I didn't know this back when I was 16. So my cousin is going, The goat man's going to get in and fucking get us. The girls are all terrified and my cousins and I are all fucking trying to figure out if it's just some hillbillies or if it's some animal. So all of a sudden, the smell just goes away. Like to this day, I haven't even experienced something like it. Like usually smells fade away or lessen. I just literally was there one second and then the next it wasn't. So it's after an hour, making it around 9 or 10. We've stopped shitting bricks enough to go back outside and stoke the fire again. We figure it was just some assholes trying to fuck with us. So we don't go back home, because we think if we do, they'll chase us through the woods or something, you know? Nothing else weird happens at night, and we stay another night. And for the main part of the night, nothing happens. At about 1 in the morning, we're outside getting drunk and telling ghost stories. As someone is finishing some too spooky story, the smell comes back. It's so fucking strong that one of the girls literally started vomiting. I stand up and you can actually feel how clammy the air is. I see we should get inside and that this isn't right. We should have just fucking left. We all go back inside and we're standing around. My cousin just keeps going on about how it's the fucking goat man. And my cousin Rooster tries to shut him the fuck up and all the while I'm just feeling that something is wrong and I can't figure out what the fuck it is. We end up sitting in there for a while. The smell is just as strong and we're terrified and all huddled in this camper. We end up cooking brats for everybody because nobody wants to go outside. It's one of those packs with four brats. We have a total of three packs that grill them up on the stove and give everybody a hot dog. I get mine. After a while, one of my cousins gets up and goes over to the pot to get another one. He starts grumbling about how I get two brats and everybody else only got one. And I look at him like he's fucking stupid. I tell him that everybody only got one because there was only 12 brats. If he wants more, he should open up a new pack and cook some more. That's when another girl that had been out with Rooster and Tan just starts screaming. Oh Jesus, oh Lord, get it out! She's crying and shivering, and then it dawns on the cousin standing up, 
what the fuck is wrong? Me and Tim both glance around the room, and then I feel my heart fucking sink. I run out of the cabin and a girl runs out with us. The trailer door is banging against the side of the trailer as everybody books it out of the cabin. One of my cousin's friends asks us what the hell was wrong. I start counting us. There's only 11 now. I shit you not, my cousin verified. There had been 12 people in the cabin, but being that everybody didn't really know each other well, nobody had really noticed the whole fucking time that there was an extra person. And then I realised earlier that I kind of noticed something was off. You know how when you're just dicking around having a good time and that you don't sweat the smallest shit and you don't always keep track of certain stuff. I'm dead sure that someone else had been in the trailer with us and that they had been there for at least a fucking day eating with us. What makes it worse? I could figure out which one because I don't think anyone ever actually interacted with the other person, the goat man. The girl kept praying to Jesus and we're all sitting outside. Eventually we get a big ass sticks and go back into the cabin. But there's nobody in there. We count again and there's 11 people. We go back into the trailer and lock the door. We explain what the fuck happened. And the girl says that she realised too. And that when he was about to say something, the person sitting next to her had grabbed her leg hard and leaned over toward her and said something she couldn't understand. So we are pretty much scared as fuck as we huddle together, and I fall asleep. When I wake up, the sun is just coming up, and half the people are asleep and the other half are packing our shit up. We all want to walk back home, but like four people want to stay until the sun is all the way up, and some people think that we are just fucking around and still want to stay at the trailers. I just want to get the fuck out of the woods. The girl's name was Kira the one that the goat man had touched. But anyway, I asked her if she really thinks it was something bad, and she says she just wants to go home and she doesn't want to be out in the woods alone for another night. So we decided to split up. The four that want to go can go, but I have to stay because I have the keys to the cabin and it's my uncle's and I have to lock up. I'm super pissed at this point because I feel like people aren't taking this shit seriously and I definitely didn't want to be out in the woods for another night. I spend the rest of the day trying to convince the rest of the people, now four girls and four guys, to get the fuck out of Dodge. Tanner leaves with them to get a rifle and says he'll be back, so there are just seven of us left by 4pm. At around 5pm, he hasn't made it back yet, and we're getting extremely fucking antsy. And the only reason I stopped begging them to go back was because he went to get a gun. It's about 5.30pm or so, when the one cousin that did stay says that the girl Kira is outside. We all look outside and sure enough, she's standing by the fire pit with her back to the cabin. I'm thinking to myself, if she was so fucking scared, why the hell would she come back? And then I get this nasty feeling in my gut. Keep in mind, the whole time the coppery smell has been gone. Now I realise I can smell just a twinge of it. I say this to the rest of them and everybody, and there are people that wanted to stay in this fucking woods after we had the goddamn goat man in our midst, is laughing at me and asking if I set this up to scare them. I'm looking at them like, I'm not fucking bullshitting you. I, I asked them why the fuck I would play like that. So one of the girls goes outside to get Kira. She gets halfway to her and stops cold. Kira starts heaving. I, I, I don't know how the fuck to describe it. Sort of like if... Someone with their back turned was laughing without actually making any sense. It was this fact that made me realise there was not a fucking sound in the whole woods. It was dead silent. This was like later in September, so it was fairly hot at the time, but it was super chilly some days too. And you could usually hear a big ass geese honking or some kind of birds or squirrels chit chatting. So I step outside of the door and tell her to come back in the fucking trailer, right now. She backs up into the trailer and we lock the door. We pull down all the shades except one and put a guy there in a chair to watch her. She stands there for another 20 minutes or so. 
The guy turns to say that she's still there, and there's a huge fucking bang at the door. We all jump up and scramble around the living room of the trailer. The banging is super loud. So now my cousin is holding one of the girls, and the other two are kinda giggling with nervous laughter, and me and the other two guys are shitting bricks. Then we hear Tan. He's screaming. Let me the fuck in, stop fucking playing. So we go over to the door and open it, and he stumbles in with a rifle. There's nobody else outside. Evidently, he had walked up to the campsite, nothing weird happened in the forest. But he had seen a girl. Mind you, he said it was not Kira standing there. When he had got into the edge of the clearing, she had turned towards him with the slack-jawed look and just stared at him, slowly tracking him as he walked around the outside of the clearing towards the camp. He said it wasn't till he was almost halfway to the trailer, he had realised that she was getting closer to him. She started off by the fire. Without him even seeing her move, she had been turning, inching closer. He said he had just ran the rest of the way back to the cabin thinking it would be open. And when he got to the door and it was locked, he turned and it was about half the distance to the door. He looks around the room and then gets super pale. He peers me to the side and whispers in my ear. You know there are only seven of us in here, right? I get that feeling where your stomach drops to your nuts. It had been back inside the trailer while we were sorting out who was going where. And then, when we all went outside to talk earlier in the day, it has just slipped right back in. We looked out the window and there is nobody out there. So we recount everyone and then basically I go over and ask everyone how many people were here earlier. And everyone says eight. I say, well, how many are here now? They all do the count and then realise there are only seven people in the cabin. So Tanner brought back a couple of boxes of ammo and his rifle. And I told his dad there was some kind of animal in the forest because he didn't think his dad would believe him if he said it was a goat man. He says that his cousin is supposed to be coming down in a few hours and that in the morning we can all go back to his place and his cousin will drive us home. Now I'm really fucking terrified but at least feel better because we can be American and shoot the fuck out of whatever it is that comes back. But then my cousin gets into the huge argument with one of the girls because she thinks that I am trying to be funny in Prankville and that she's getting really scared and that I'm not funny. He keeps telling her I'm not that kind of person and she says, well, how do we know this girl wasn't just Tanner in a wig? And if it's really the goat man, how do we know that it's the real Tanner and the goat man just didn't kill Tanner in the woods and take his gun? So we get into this huge fucking argument, where me and Tan are like, we could seriously be in danger because at the very least, someone has been sneaking themselves into our fucking trailer without us knowing and mingling with us. And at worst, something bad is in the forest fucking with us. One of the girls is crying and says she wants to go right now, and we are trying to tell her we shouldn't because none of us are walking through the woods in the middle of the night. At this point, the sun is starting to go down, and it's getting a little cloudy out. We eat something and turn on the radio for a while, but we can't really get a station out there with anything decent. So we turn it off at about the time that Tan's cousin shows up. He was like 19, I think. At this point, the sun is just barely over the horizon, and he has one of those heavy-duty lantern flashlights and another rifle. He walks up to the trailer, and we whisper to Tan, asking if he's sure that's his cousin, and says yes. The guy looks behind him and all around the camp, then walks in. He kind of glances at all of us and looks a little confused. He says, where's your other little buddy at? I figured she would meet me at the cabin. Is she a little slow or something? He also asked whether we had been cooking blood in the cabin because it smelled like blood and hot pans all the way up the trail. We are all like, fucking nope. But we ask him what he's talking about with the girl he saw. He had come down the same trail Tan had been using, and he had come up on one of you guys' buddies standing in the middle of the trail, look at him slack jaws. He had asked her a bunch of questions, but all she did was just look at him. Then she smiled at him, and he kept walking. 
She couldn't seem to keep up with him and kept lagging a little behind him. He said he asked her if she was hurt or something and if she needed any help. But she had continued to stare. Eventually, he had been walking and turned around a bend in the trail. But when he turned around and went back to see if she was okay, the trail was empty. He had assumed that she had taken some shortcut through the woods to her trailer. You tell him the whole story of what's been going on. I half expected him to say we're full of shit, but he just listened and then sat down on the couches in the living room. Tanner's cousin gets back to the girl. He says, when she had kept trying to lag behind him, that it kind of weirded him out, so he tried to keep her in front of him. But no matter how slow he walked, she was always lagging a little behind, and that he smelled this nasty smell and it got stronger as he got to the camp. Eventually, it got really strong. She had said something really low that he didn't quite catch, and when he had turned around, she had been right the fuck up on him, and he stepped back from her. It was at this point he asked her if she was okay, and if she wasn't, him to carry her back the rest of the way, and she just kept staring. He said he reached out for her, as in to grab her on the shoulder, but he must have misjudged the distance, because she was off to the side of where he had put his hand like she had moved while he was looking dead at her. So at this point, we know this shit's real. Unless Tan is playing a joke, which we can tell he's not because he's almost pissing his pants. So they load up their rifles, we eat some more, and we just kind of sit around till about 11. To this day, every time I think about this, I really pray to God that it's some huge prank that my cousins played on me and just never revealed it. So I would shit it for the rest of my life. At around 11, the stink of copper turns into an actual nasty gross blood-like smell, like cooking blood and singed hair. Tan and his cousin, Reese, get the fuck up instantly and grab the rifles. There's like a half knocking, half clawing at the door, and I shit you not, there's this voice. And it sounds like when you see those YouTube cats and dogs whose owners teach them how to talk, it's saying in this halting, weirdly toned voice, let me the fuck in, stop fucking playing. It made my nuts creep up against my body and one of the girls just starts crying and calling on Jesus. I was so fucking obviously not a person talking, it didn't, it didn't have the right cadence and that's some shit that I never realised until that moment. But all people have a certain cadence when they talk, no matter what language. All people have a certain kind of rhythm to talking. This shits didn't have any kind of cadence or rhythm. One of those YouTube cats. That is what the fuck it sounded like outside the door. So now I'm in full on terror mode. We keep yelling outside. Who is it? Stop fucking around man. And it just keeps saying. In or let me the fuck in. For almost 15 minutes. So then the smell goes away for a while. And for the next hour or so, you can hear someone basically creeping around in the woods and shit. Every couple of minutes, it'll come back into the door and say something. Finally, when the smell does fade away, it's around two in the morning. We says, man, fuck this, and opens a door and walks outside with his rifle. He fires a shot into the air. He says something to the effect of, in the name of Jesus Christ, go away. He fires two more times and then from the woods right up against the river across from the trailer. It sounds like something is slowly gibbering and hooting. Then it starts screaming, and it sounds almost like a woman and a cat in a bag screaming together. Like I seriously have never heard anything like this. You can hear the brush over that way start to shake. Reese fires over into the tree line, and then starts backing into the house. We lock the door, and you can hear the shit keening and screaming. We say something had come out of the bushes, super low to the ground and crawling towards the cabin. He had shot it. Pretty much, that was how the rest of the night went. It was literally screaming constantly for the next two hours, and we could hear shit moving out into the tree line. But it never came back up to the cabin until everyone had finally fallen asleep. Tan had been sitting in a chair watching the door with his rifle. No one else heard or saw this and he told me two days later after the whole thing was over. He said he had been nodding off after the screaming and noises finally stopped, and he had been almost asleep when he saw someone come out of the bathroom 
and then lay down in the middle of the floor and go to sleep. He just assumed it was one of us and he had nodded off. Then he said he kind of realised something was wrong and while pretending to be asleep in, he counted us. There were nine people in the cabin. He basically didn't want to try shoot at the fucking thing in the cabin and have it kill us all and there or have Reese wake up and start shooting and then we kill ourselves. So he just stayed awake all night pretending to be asleep. He said sometimes it would stand up and kind of do this weird jittery thing or heave like it was laughing but then it would just lay back down. The story closes pretty weak because from my perspective nothing happened. We woke up and I noticed that Tan was a little jittery and that he was avoiding looking at all of us. But we ate some breakfast, packed up and started walking to his house. He stayed last in the cabin and he said he'd lock up and bring my uncle's keys to just start walking and he'd catch up, which I didn't really want to fucking do. We got a little bit up the path and when he came running up, basically we just jogged back to the house. His cousin took us home. There was a window in the bathroom. Tan had gone back to lock up and looked in there. We were too stupid to lock. We were too stupid to lock a screenless window. The window was fucking up when he went in there. I'm guessing it had been doing... I'm guessing it had been doing that all along. Waiting for us to fall asleep or slip up and then getting in among us. It walked with us all the goddamn way back to the house. And then he said it lagged to the back of the group and looked him dead in the eyes before walking into the woods. Number 2 Sunday I'm not sure why I'm writing this down on paper and not on my computer. I guess I've just noticed some odd things. It's not that I don't trust the computer, I just need to organise my thoughts. I need to get down all the details somewhere objective. Somewhere I know that what I write can't be deleted or changed. Not that that's happened. It's just... Everything blurs together here. And the fog of memory lends a strange cast to things. I'm starting to feel cramped in this small apartment. Maybe that's the problem. I just had to go and choose the cheapest apartment. The only one in the basement. The lack of windows down here makes the day and night seem to slip by seamlessly. I haven't been out in a few days because I've been working on this programming project so intensely. I suppose I just wanted to get it done. Hours of sitting and staring at a monitor can make anyone feel strange. I know, but I don't think that's it. I'm not sure when I first started to feel like something was odd. I can't even define what it is. Maybe I just haven't talked to anyone in a while. That's the first thing that crept up on me. Everyone I normally talk to online while I program has been idle, or they've simply not logged on at all. My instant messages go unanswered. The last email I got from anybody was a friend saying he talked to me when he got back from the store, and that was yesterday. I'd call with my cell phone, but reception's terrible down here. Yeah, that's it. I just need to call someone. I'm going to go outside. Well, that didn't work too well. As the tingle of fear fades, I'm feeling a little ridiculous for being scared at all. I looked in the mirror before I went out, but I didn't shave the two-day stubble I've grown. I figured I was just going out for a quick cell phone call. I did change my shirt though, because it was lunchtime and I guessed that I'd run into at least one person I knew. That didn't end up happening. I wish it did. When I went out, I opened the door to my small apartment slowly. A small feeling of apprehension had somehow already lodged itself in me, for some indefinable reason. I chalked it up to having not spoken to anyone but myself for a day or two. I peered down that clingy grey hallway, made dingier by the fact that it was a basement hallway. On one end, a large metal door led to the building's furnace room. It was locked, of course. Two dreary soda machines stood by it. I bought a soda from the one the first day I moved in. 
but it had a two-year-old expiration date. I'm fairly sure nobody knows those machines are even down here, or my cheap landlady just doesn't care to get them restocked. I closed my door softly and walked the other direction, taking care not to make a sound. I have no idea why I chose to do that, but it was fun giving in to the strange impulse not to break the droning hum of the soda machines, at least for the moment. I got to the stairwell and took the stairs up to the building's front door. I looked through the heavy door's small square window and received quite the shock. It was definitely not lunchtime, city gloom hung over the dark street outside, and the traffic light at the intersection in the distance blinked yellow. Dim clouds, purple and black from the glow of the city, hung overhead. Nothing moved, save the few sidewalk trees that shifted in the wind. I remember shivering, though it wasn't cold. Maybe it was the wind outside. I could vaguely hear it through the heavy metal door, and I knew it was that unique kind of late night wind. The kind that was consistent, cold and quiet, save for the rhythmic music it made as it passed through countless unseen tree leaves. I decided not to go outside. Instead, I lifted my cell phone to the door and checked the signal meter. The bars filled up the meter and I smiled. Time to hear someone else's voice, I remember thinking, relieved. It was such a strange thing, to be afraid of nothing. I shook my head, laughing at myself silently. I hit speed dial for my best friend Amy's number and held the phone up to my ear. It rang once, but then stopped. Nothing happened. I listened to silence for a good 20 seconds, then hung up. I frowned and looked at the signal meter again, still full. I went to dial her number again. Then my phone rang in my hand, startling me. I put it up to my ear. Hello? I asked immediately fighting down a small shock at hearing the first spoken voice in days, even if it was my own. I'd gotten used to the droning hum of the building's inner workings, my computer and the soda machine in the hallway. There was no response to my greeting at first, but then finally a voice came. Hey, said a clear male voice, obviously a college age like me. Who's this? John. I replied, confused. Oh, sorry, wrong number, he replied, then hung up. I lowered the phone slowly and leaned against the thick brick wall of the stairwell. That was strange. I looked at my received calls list, but the number was unfamiliar. Before I could think on it further, the phone rang loudly, shocking me yet again. This time I looked at the caller before I answered. It was another unfamiliar number. This time I held the phone up to my ear, but said nothing. I heard nothing but the general background noise of a phone. Then a familiar voice broke my attention. John? was a single word in Amy's voice. I breathed a sigh of relief. Hey, it's you, I replied. Who else would it be? she responded. Oh, the number. I'm at a party on 7th Street. My phone died just as you called me. This is someone else's phone, obviously. Oh, okay, I said. Where are you? She asked. My eyes glanced over the drab white washed cylinder block walls and the heavy metal door with its small window. At my building, I sighed, just feeling cooped up. I didn't realize it was so late. You should come here, she said, laughing. Nah, I don't feel like looking for some strange place by myself in the middle of the night. Looking out of the window at the silent windy street that secretly scared me just a tiny bit. I think I'm going to keep working or go to bed. Nonsense, she replied. I can come get you. Your building is close to 7th Street, right? How drunk are you? I asked lightheartedly. You know where I live? Oh, of course, she said abruptly. I guess I can't get there by walking, huh? You could if you wanted to waste half an hour, I told her. Right, she said. Okay, I have to go. Good luck with your work. I lowered the phone once more, looking at the numbers flash as the call ended. Then the droning silence suddenly reasserted itself into my ears. 
The two strange calls in the eerie street outside just drove home my aloneness in this empty stairwell. Perhaps from having seen too many scary movies, I had this sudden, inexplicable idea that something could look in the door's window and see me. Some sort of horrible entity that hovered at the edge of aloneness, just waiting to creep up on unsuspecting people that strayed too far from the other human beings. I knew the fear was irrational, but nobody else was around. So I jumped down the stairs, ran down the hallway into my room, and closed the door as swiftly as I could, while still staying silent. Like I said, I feel a little ridiculous for being scared of nothing, and the fear has already faded. Writing this down helps a lot, it makes me realise that nothing is wrong. It filters out half-formed thoughts and fears and leaves only cold, hard facts. It's late, I got a call from a wrong number, and Amy's phone died, so she called me back from another phone. Nothing strange is happening. Still, there was something a little off about that conversation. I know it could have just been the alcohol she's had, or was it even her that seemed off to me? Or was it? Yes, that, that was it. I didn't realise it until this moment. Writing these things down. I knew writing things down would help. She said she was at the party, but I only heard silence in the background. Of course, that doesn't mean anything in particular, as she could have just gone outside to make the call. No, that couldn't be it either. I, I didn't hear the wind. I need to see if the wind is still blowing. Monday. I forgot to finish writing last night. I'm not sure what I expected to see when I ran up the stairwell and looked out the heavy metal door's window. I'm feeling ridiculous. Last night's fear seems hazy and unreasonable to me now. I can't wait to go out into the sunlight. I'm going to check my email, shave, shower and finally get out of here. Wait, I think I heard something. It was thunder. That whole sunlight and fresh air thing didn't happen. I went out into the stairwell and up the stairs, only to find disappointment. The heavy metal door's little window shoved only flowing water as torrential rain slammed against it. Only a very dim, gloomy light flittered in through the rain, but at least I knew it was daytime, even if it was a grey, sickly wet day. I tried looking out the window and waiting for lightning to illuminate the gloom, but the rain was too heavy and I couldn't make out anything more than the vague, weird shapes moving at odd angles in the waves washing down the window. Disappointed, I turned around, but I didn't want to go back to my room. Instead, I wandered further up the stairs, past the first floor and the second. The stairs ended at the third floor, the highest floor in the building. I looked through the glass that ran up the outer wall of the stairwell, but it was that warped, thick kind that scatters the light. Not that there was much to see through the rain to begin with. I opened the stairwell door and wandered down the hallway. The ten or so thick wooden doors, painted blue a long time ago, were all closed. I listened as I walked, but it was the middle of the day, so I wasn't surprised that I heard nothing but the rain outside. As I stood there in the dim hallway, listening to the rain, I had the strange fleeting impression that the doors were standing like silent granite monoliths erected by some ancient foreign civilization for some unfathomable guardian purpose. Lightning flashed and I could have sworn that just for a moment, the old grainy blue wood looked just like that rough stone. I laughed at myself for letting my imagination get the best of me. But well, then it occurred to me that the dim gloom and lightning must mean there was a window somewhere in the hallway. A vague memory surfaced, and I suddenly recalled the third floor and an inset window halfway down the floor's hallway. Excited to look out into the rain and possibly see another human being, I quickly walked over to the alcove, finding the large thin glass window. Rain washed down it as with the front door's window, but I could open this one. I reached a hand out to slide it open, but hesitated. I had the strangest feeling that if I opened that window, 
I would see something absolutely horrifying on the other side. Everything's been so odd lately. So I came up with a plan. And I came back here to get what I needed. I don't seriously think anything will come of it, but I'm bored. It's raining and I'm going to start crazy. I came back to get my webcam. The card isn't long enough to reach the third floor by any means, so instead of going to hide it between the two soda machines in the dark end of my basement hallway, run the wire along the wall and under my door, and put black duct tape over the wire to blend it in with the black plastic strip that runs along the base of the hallway's walls. I know this is silly, but I don't have anything better to do. Well, nothing happened. I propped open a hallway to stairwell door, steeled myself, then flung the heavy front door wide open and ran like hell down the stairs to my room and slammed the door. I watched the webcam on my computer, intently seeing the hallway outside my door and most of the stairwell. I am watching it right now, and I don't see anything interesting. I just wish the camera's position was different so that I could see out the front door. Hey, someone's online. I got out an older, less functional webcam that I had in my closet to video chat with my friend online. I couldn't really explain to him why I wanted to video chat, but it felt good to see another person's face. He couldn't talk very long, and we didn't talk about anything meaningful, but I felt much better. My strange fear had almost passed and I would feel completely better, but there was something odd about our conversation. I know what I've said that everything had seemed odd, but still, he was very vague in his responses. I can't recall one specific thing he said, no particular name, or place, or event, but he did ask for my email address to keep in touch. Wait, I just got an email. I'm about to go out. I just got an email from Amy that asked me to meet her for dinner at the place we usually go to. I do love pizza and I've just been eating random food from my poorly stocked fridge for days, so I can't wait. Again, I feel ridiculous about the odd couple of days I've been having. I should destroy this journal when I get back. Oh, another email. Oh my god, I almost left the email and opened the door. I almost opened the door. I almost opened the door, but I read the email first. It was from a friend I hadn't heard from in a long time, and it was sent to a huge number of emails that must have been every person he had saved on his address list. It had no subject, and it said simply, Seen with your own eyes, don't trust them, they. What the hell is that supposed to mean? The words shock me, and I keep going over and over them. It is a desperate email sent just as... Something happened. The words are obviously cut off without finishing. On any other day, I would have dismissed this as spam from a computer virus or something. But the words, seen with your own eyes. I can't help but read over this journal and think back on the last few days and realise that I have not seen another person with my own eyes or talked to another person face to face. The webcam conversation with my friend was so strange, so vague and so eerie. Now that I think about it. Was it eerie, or is the fear clouding my memory? My mind toys with the progression of events I have written here, pointing out that I have not been presented with one single fact that I did not specifically give out unsuspectingly. The random wrong number that got my name and the subsequent strange return call from Amy. The friend that asked for my email address. I messaged him first when I saw him online, and then I got my first email a few minutes after that conversation. Uh, oh my god. That phone call with Amy. I said over the phone, I said that I was within a half hour's walk of 7th Street. They know I'm near here. What if they're trying to find me? Where is everyone else? Why haven't I seen or heard anyone else in days? No one. This is crazy. Maybe I need to calm down. This madness needs to end. I don't know what to think. I ran about my apartment furiously, holding my cell phone up to every corner to see if I got a signal through the heavy walls. Finally, in the tiny bathroom near one ceiling corner, 
I got a single bar. Holding my phone there, I sent a text message to every number on my list, not wanting to betray anything about my unfounded fears. I simply said, You seen anyone face to face lately? At this point, I just wanted any reply back. I didn't care what the reply was or if I embarrassed myself. I tried to call someone a few times, but I couldn't get my head up high enough, and if I brought my cell phone down even an inch, it lost signal. Then I would remembered the computer and rushed over to it, instant messaging everyone online. Most were idle or away from their computer. Nobody responded. My messages grew more frantic and I started telling people where I was and stopped by in person for a host of barely passable reasons. I didn't care about anything by that point. I just needed to see another person. I also tore apart my apartment looking for something that I might have missed. Some way to contact another human being without opening the door. I know it's crazy, I know it's unfounded, but what if, what if, I just need to be sure. I taped the phone to the ceiling in case. Tuesday. The phone rang. Exhausted from last night's rampage, I must have fallen asleep. I woke up to the phone ringing and ran into the bathroom, stood on the toilet and flipped open the phone taped to the ceiling. It was Amy, and I feel so much better. She was really worried about me and had apparently been trying to contact me since last time I talked to her. She's coming over now and yes, she knows where I am without me telling her. I feel so embarrassed. I am definitely throwing this journal away before anyone sees it. I don't even know why I'm writing it now. Maybe it's just because it's the only communication I've had at all since God knows when. I look like hell too. I looked in the mirror before I came back in here. My eyes are sunken, my stubble is thicker, and I just look generally unhealthy. My apartment is trashed, but I'm not going to clean it up. I think I need someone else to see what I've been through. The past few days have not been normal. I am not one to imagine things. I know I have been the victim of an extreme probability. I probably miss seeing another person a dozen times. I just happened to go out when it was late at night or the middle of the day when everyone was gone. Everything is perfectly fine. I know this now. Plus, I found something in the closet last night that helped me tremendously. A television. I set it up before I wrote this, and it's on in the background. Television has always been an escape for me, and it reminds me that there's a world beyond these dingy brick walls. I'm glad Amy's the one that responded to me after last night's frantic pestering of everyone I could contact. She's been my best friend for years. She doesn't know it, but I count the day that I met her among one of the few moments of true happiness in my life. I remember that warm summer day fondly. It seems a different reality from this dark, rainy, lonely place. I feel like I spent days sitting in that playground, much too old to play just talking with her and hanging around doing nothing at all. I still feel like I can go back to that moment sometimes, and it reminds me that this damn place is not all that there is. Finally, a knock on the door. I thought it was odd that I couldn't see her through the camera I had between the two soda machines. I figured that it was bad positioning, like when I couldn't see out the front door. I should have known. After the knock, I yelled through the door jokingly that I had a camera between the soda machines, because I was embarrassed to myself that I had taken the paranoia so far. After I did that, I saw her image walk over to the camera and look down at it. She smiled and waved. Hey, she said to the camera brightly, giving it a weary look. It's weird, I know, I said into the mic attached to my computer. I've had a weird few days. Must have, she replied. Open the door, John. I hesitated. How could I be sure? Hey. Humor me a second, I told her through the mic. Tell me one thing about us. Just prove to me you're you. She gave the camera a weird look. I'm alright, she said slowly, thinking. We met randomly at the playground when we were both way too old to be there. I sighed deeply as the reality returned and fear faded. God, I'd been so ridiculous. Of course it was Amy. That day wasn't anywhere in the world except to my memory. I never even mentioned it to anyone, not out of embarrassment, but out of a strange secret nostalgia 
and a longing for those days to return. If there was some unknown force at work trying to trick me, as I feared, there was no way they could have known about that day. <laughs> Alright, I'll explain everything, I told her. I'll be right there. I ran to my small bathroom and fixed my hair as best as I could. I looked like hell, but she would understand. Snickering at my own unbelievable behaviour and the mess I'd made of this place, I walked to the door. I put my hand on the doorknob and gave the mess one last look. So ridiculous, I thought. My eyes traced over the half-eaten food lying on the ground, the overflowing trash bin, and the bed I tipped to the side looking for God knows what. I almost turned to the door and opened it, but my eyes fell on one last thing. The old webcam. The one I used for that eerie, vacant chat with my friend. Its silent black sphere lay haphazardly tossed to one side. Its lens pointed at the table where this journal lay. An overwhelming terror looked at me as I realised. If something could see through the camera, it would have seen what I had just wrote about that day. I asked her for anything about us, and she chose the one thing in the world that I had thought they or I didn't know. But it did. It did know. It could have been watching me the whole time. I didn't open the door. I screamed. I screamed in uncontrollable terror. I stomped an old webcam on the floor. The door shook and the doorknob tried to turn, but I didn't hear Amy's voice through the door. Was the basement door made to keep out drafts too thick, or was Amy not outside? What could have been trying to get in, if not her? What the hell is out there? I, I saw her on my computer through the camera outside. I heard her on the speakers through the camera. But was it real? How can I know? She's gone now. I screamed and shouted for help. I piled up everything in my apartment against the front door. Friday at least I think it's Friday. I broke everything, electronic. I smashed my computer to pieces. Every single thing on there could have been accessed by network access, or worse, altered. I'm a programmer, I know. Every little piece of information I gave out since this started, my name, my email, my location, none of it came back from outside until I gave it out. I've been going over and over what I wrote. I've been pacing back and forth, alternating between stark phantom entity is dead. Alternating between stark terror and overpowering disbelief. Sometimes I'm absolutely certain some phantom entity is dead set on the simple goal of getting me to go outside. Back to the beginning, with the phone call from Amy. She was effectively asking me to open the door and go outside. I keep running through it in my head. One point of view says I've acted like a madman, and all of this is an extreme convergence of probability. Never going outside at the right times by pure luck, never seeing another person by pure chance, getting a random nonsense email from some computer virus at just the right time. The other point of view says that the extreme convergence of probability is the reason that whatever's out there has gotten me already. I keep thinking I never opened a window on the third floor. I never opened the front door until this incredibly stupid stunt with a hidden camera, after which I ran straight to my room and slammed the door. I haven't opened my own solid door since I flung open the front door of the building. Whatever's out there, if anything out there, never made an appearance in the building before I opened the front door. Maybe the reason I wasn't in the building already was that it was elsewhere getting everyone else. And then it waited, until I betrayed my existence by trying to call Amy. A call which didn't work, until it called me and asked me my name. Terror literally overwhelms me every time I try to fit the pieces of this nightmare together. That email, short, cut off, was it from someone trying to get word out? Some friendly voice desperately trying to warn me before it came. Seen with my own eyes, don't trust them. Exactly what I've been suspicious of. It could be masterful control of all things electronic, practicing its insidious deception to trick me into coming outside. Why can't it get in? It knocked on the door. I must have some solid presence. It must have some solid presence. The door, 
the image of those doors in the upper hallway as guardian monoloths flashes back in my mind every time I trace this path of thoughts. If there's some phantom entity trying to get me to go outside, maybe it can't get through doors. I keep thinking back over all the books I've read or movies I've seen, trying to generate some explanation for this. Doors have always been such an intense focus of human imagination, always seen as wards or portals or of special importance, or perhaps the door is just too thick. I know that I couldn't bash through any of the doors in this building, let alone the heavy basement one. Aside from that, the real question is, why does it even want me? If it just wanted to kill me, it could do in any number of ways, including just waiting until I starve to death. What if it doesn't want to kill me? What if it has some more far horrific fate in store for me? What can I do to escape this nightmare? A knock on the door. I told the people on the other side of the door, I need a minute to think and I'll come out. I'm really just writing this down so I can figure out what to do. At least this time I heard the voices, my paranoia, and Jess. I recognise I am being paranoid, as me thinking of all sorts of ways that their voices could be faked electronically. There could be nothing but speakers outside, stimulating human voices. Did it really take them three days to come talk to me? Amy is supposedly out there, along with two policemen and a psychiatrist. Maybe it took them three days to think of what to say to me. The psychiatrist's claim could be pretty convincing. If I decided to think this has all been a crazy misunderstanding, and not some entity trying to trick me into opening the door, the psychiatrist had an older voice. Authoritarian, but still caring. I liked it. I'm desperate just to see someone with my own eyes. He said I have something called cyber psychosis, and I'm just one of a nationwide epidemic of thousands of people having breakdowns triggered by a suggestive email that got through somehow. I swear he said got through somehow. I think he meant spread through this country inexplicably, but I am incredibly suspicious that the entity slipped up and revealed something. He said I am part of a wave of emergent behaviour. But a lot of other people are having the same problem with the same fears, even though we've never communicated. That neatly explains the strange email about eyes that I got. I didn't get the original triggering email. I got a descendant of it. My friend could have broken down too and tried to warn everyone he knew against the paranoid fears. That's how the problem spreads, the psychiatrist claims. I could have spread it too with my texts and instant messages online to everyone I know. One of those people might be melting down right now after being triggered by something I sent them. Something they might interpret any way that they want. Something like a text saying, seen anyone face to face lately? The psychiatrist told me that he didn't want to lose another one. That people like me are intelligent and that's our downfall. We draw connections so well that we draw them even when they shouldn't be there. He said it's easy to get caught up in the paranoia in our fast-paced world, a constantly changing place where more and more of our interaction is stimulated. I have to give him one thing, it's a great explanation. It neatly explains everything. It perfectly explains everything, in fact. I have every reason to shake off this nightmarish fear that something or consciousness or being out there wants me to open a door so I can capture me for some horrible fate worse than death. I would be foolish after hearing that explanation, to stay in here until I starve to death just despite this entity that might have got everyone else. I would be foolish to think that, after hearing that explanation, I might be one of the last few people alive on an empty world, hiding in my secure basement room, spitting some unthinkable deceptive entity just by refusing to be captured. It's a perfect explanation for every single strange thing I've seen or heard, and I have every reason in this world to let all of my fears go and open the door. That's exactly what I'm not going to do. How can I be sure? How can I know what's real and what's deception? All of these damn things with their wires and their signals that originate from some unseen origin 
they're not real. I can't be sure. Signals through a camera. Fake video. Deceptive phone calls. Emails. Even a television lying broken on the floor. How can I possibly know it's real? It's just signals, waves, light. The door, it's bashing on the door. It's trying to get in. What insane mechanical contravance could it be using to stimulate the sound of men attacking the heavy wood so well? At least I finally see it with my own eyes. There's nothing left in here for it to deceive me with. I've ripped apart everything else. It can't deceive my eyes, can it? See with your own eyes, don't trust them, they... Wait, was that the desperate message telling me to trust my eyes? Or warning me about my eyes too? Oh, oh my god, what's the difference between a camera and my eyes? They both turn light into electrical signals. They're the same. I can't be deceived. I have to be sure, I have to be sure. Data unknown. I calmly asked for paper and pen. Day in and day out until it finally gave them to me. Not that it matters. What am I going to do? Poke my eyes out? The bandages feel like part of me now. The pain is gone. I figured this will be one of my last chances to write legibly. As without my sight to correct mistakes, my hands will slowly forget the motions involved. This is a sort of self-indulgence, this writing. It's a relic of another time. I'm certain everyone left in this world is dead, or something far worse. I sit against the padded wall day in and day out, the entity bring me food and water. It masks itself as a kind nurse, as an unsympathetic doctor. I think it knows that my hearing has sharpened considerably now that I live in darkness. It fakes conversations in the hallways on the off chance that I might overhear. One of the nurses talks about having a baby soon. One of the doctors lost his wife in a car accident. None of it matters. None of it is real. None of it gets to me. Not like she does. That's the worst part. The part I almost can't handle. The thing comes to me. Masquerading as Amy. Its recreation is perfect. It sounds exactly like her. Makes me feel in its lifelike cheeks. When it first dragged me here, it told me all the things I wanted to hear. It told me that she loved me, that she had always loved me, and that it didn't understand why I did this. That we could still have a life together if only I would stop insisting that I was being deceived. It wanted me to believe. No, it needed me to believe that she was real. I almost fell for it, I really did. I doubted myself for the longest time. In the end though, it was just all too perfect, too flawless and too real. The false Amy used to come over every day, and then every week and finally stopped coming together. I don't think the entity will give up. I think the waiting game is just another one of its gambits. I will resist it for the rest of my life if I have to. I don't know what happened to the rest of the world, but I do know that this thing needs me to fall for its deceptions. If it needs that, then maybe, just maybe, I am a thorn in its agenda. Maybe Amy is still alive out there somewhere, kept alive only by my will to resist the deceiver. I hold on to that hope, rocking back and forth in my cell to pass the time. I will never give in. I will never break. I am a hero. The doctor read the paper the patient had scribbled on, and it was barely readable, written in the shaky script of one who could not see. He wanted to smile at the man's steadfast resolve, a reminder of the human will to survive, but he knew the patient was completely delusional. After all, a sane man would have fallen for the deception long ago. The doctor wanted to smile, he wanted to whisper words of encouragement to the delusional man, he wanted to scream, but the nerve filaments wrapped around his head and into his eyes made him do otherwise. His body walked into the cell like a puppet and told the patient once more that he was wrong and that there was nothing trying to deceive him. Number 3 Gavin thoughtlessly picked up the bandages around his right arm. I've done this job for so many years but I never experienced something like this. 
He used his left hand to brush a light brown hair out of his face. I'm sorry if I'm rambling random stuff. I just can't get her face out of my head. Whenever I close my eyes or whenever I lie down to sleep, I only see her staring at me with this anger. This strange woman. I mean, I know she's dead, but why do I need to keep seeing her face? It's as if she's haunting me. Gavin took a deep breath. I have been training and tutoring since I was 16. In the evenings I taught English and biology, and on the weekend I taught rugby. Both of it was in the poor neighbourhood. The area had quite a bad reputation with drugs and gangs, and I heard a lot about abductions and murders and carjackings there. He forced a smile. I'm quite big, I know, but still I never felt comfortable there. If anything, I thought that my size made me more obvious, more of a target. I just knew I was out of place. After my last student, I usually basically ran to my car, and the moment I got inside, I locked the doors and drove off as quickly as I could. Gavin shook his head. I did that so many times, at some point it wasn't even a fear anymore. It was nearly automatic. I ran out of the house, unlocked the car, and jumped in. It wasn't something I thought about. But that evening, I got out later than usual. My student had a test and wanted me to stay longer. As a private teacher, that's not really a request, it's more of an order. If you don't comply, you will quickly find somebody else. So I stayed longer, nearly until 11pm. And right away when I ran to my car, something felt off. Gravin scratched his arms. It was as if the street was different from what I remembered, and the car itself seemed different, maybe more dirty than usual. I literally ran inside, threw my bag into the back and locked the door, and then I noticed a woman sitting in the passenger seat, with this crazy look in her eyes. She had something in her hand that really looked like a weapon, maybe a bomb or something, and she was shouting at me in an angry language. It sounded like Arabic or something, I was terrified, I just didn't know what to do. And so I started the engine and drove off. I didn't even think about how small she was. She seemed so angry and I didn't dare to question her. She kept gesturing towards the sides of the street. Whenever she did, I looked for the next street and took a turn. But this woman was crazy. I mean, I don't know what she wanted. No matter how much I complied with her order, she kept getting more and more aggravated. And then she even started hitting me. She hit first my arms, straight with her fingernails into my flesh. I pushed her back, but I was still driving and couldn't keep her to the side. So that somehow made her even madder as she hit me only harder as I was trying to scratch and hit my face. Gavin rubbed his knuckles. I don't know what came over me. It was more like instinct, like, you know, self-defense. I just hit her straight in the face. I didn't even think of it. I just hit her and moved the car to the right of the road to hold her back. But she got only more furious and she kept shouting something about Allah and she kept lashing out at me. It was as if she was trying to stab my eyes, and so I hit her again, two, three, four more times, until she stopped moving. And only then, when I saw her lying there, with her head against the window, while I was fumbling for my mobile phone to call the police, I looked in the mirror and saw the two small children. They were just sitting there, frozen in place, staring at me. They didn't say a word. But then I looked around for the first time, I really looked around. And only then I realised that it was the same model, even the same colour. But there were stickers on the windows, a small dancing Elvis on the dashboard, and the stereo didn't look like mine. It looked like mine, it wasn't my car. I really didn't want to kill her, it, it was just my brain running on autopilot. Thank you all for listening, it's been my pleasure truly. Perhaps time to listen to another narration I have. Just go and have a look at my channel and see what I've recommended for you. Anyway, as always, I'll catch you on the next one. Thank you.